And hello everybody, it's Thursday, it's the first week of comics in 2013 and things are slightly different. You may have noticed right at the start, I've shown you everything I'm already going to review. Um, this is kind of because people have asked me to either put it in the description bar below all the comics I'm going to be reviewing. Um, which is fine. I would have preferred not to have done that. Um, just so it's a, it's a kind of a surprise. So you don't know what's coming. Um, but really, it's because of the other change that is going to happen in these reviews. And that is, I felt last year, I was kind of held back somewhat in um, reviewing the comics. In the sense that I didn't want to put too many spoilers in there um, and reveal stuff that was going on in the stories and you've got to believe me this makes it very difficult to review a comic when I can't talk about certain things that go in that are going on so the warning is here and I will warn you for a few more videos and then it's it's all down to you there will potentially be spoilers from now on. Um, I'll reveal things that are happening in the storylines um, that may have been kept quiet for a while and no one's been talking about it. Um, so with that said, I've shown you what comics I'm going to review. If you haven't read any of them yet or if you haven't read a few of them yet, I would suggest you stop the video now, read your bloody comics and then come back. I like return visits. Um, I have to say, I'm a little perturbed with the shelves. They're very empty. It feels very bare and exposed. So, without further ado, I've got six comics to review this week to start filling up, filling them back up. And we begin with something that kind of feels a bit pointless to review because I'm not going to get any of the rest. Um, and that will be explained in this. Punisher Nightmare, issue one. And yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan of the Punisher. Um, and I'll, I'll collect pretty much anything that comes out um, that has Punisher um, on the top there. Um, but looking closely at this, Right, it's coming out every week for the first five, for five weeks. It's a five issue mini series. Now that in itself isn't really anything that would put me off. But then you see the price tag. It's $3.99 and you're like, what, I'm gonna pay this for five weeks. There better be something good about this series. Um, they throw on the front a five issue weekly event from a writer producer of tv's the walking dead i like the way they put from a writer producer so uh, all those of us that were going a bit giddy and thinking oh, it's gonna be robert kirkman it's gonna be robert kirkman well it's not it's some guy called gimple now i love me some walking dead love the tv show um I don't really ever know who's written it. I know if I've enjoyed the series. I don't really care who's written it as long as they put on a good show. So it didn't matter who was writing this, but they are kind of pushing it forward that, oh, someone from The Walking Dead is writing this. You must go out and buy it. Well, not really. Um, so... That's put me off getting any of it. This, for me, will probably be a pickup in trade where it'll be so much cheaper to get. Given this is going to have been concluded in like five weeks, less than a month and a half, I'll probably only have to wait another month and a half to um, 
to get it in trade so and it'll be so much cheaper so anyway for those of you who are interested i want to pick this up for five weeks concurrently um it's the punisher meets i guess a potential punisher uh, the story is kind of it flips back and forth between Punisher um, doing his thing, punishing, scaring the bejesus out of everyone he meets, and also a character called Jake Nyman. And the similar similarities between these two characters become incredibly apparent right at the very beginning of this story, where Jake's family, uh, his wife and his daughter, are gunned down. In Central Park, he's left for dead, but actually he's he goes to hospital and well. So already the two have incredibly close connections already, and obviously Punisher picks up on this bit of this new story and is gonna go out and find out who killed this man's um, family. And through his investigations, he finds a kind of blog journal of this guy um, through um, his time in the war, in, in a war, the war. It's not really so close to where it is, but Bin Laden, I think, was in there. Um, so it it's out there in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. <laughs> um, and so you get this kind of split story, like I said, with Punisher going out looking for the killers and the kind of backstory of where uh, this guy, Jake, came from. And it's okay. It's The story moves along. You get Punisher being Punisher, um, doing his whole kind of shaking down the hoodlums and the crim street criminals, trying to find all the information he can. Um, and it's the ending that kind of spoils it a little bit. I'm sure it was meant to be incredibly dramatic, but I just found it a bit funny. Uh, we have Jake Nyman in this hospital bed, third degree burns, apparently kind of in a coma, I guess, or lie there. Well, he can't apparently move. I mean, third degree burns, that's pretty bad. Um, he's on a respirator and all that. Uh, and Punisher turns up just to kind of whisper in his ear, you know, uh, hopefully you can hear this, but I'm going to get your killer. And suddenly this guy bolts upright. He's in like kind of soldier mode and he's saying, Punisher, stand down, stand down. I'm going to get my revenge. And it's just the most hilarious final panel. Um, and I'm sure it was meant to be incredibly dramatic, but couldn't help laughing. Um, for fans of The Punisher, go out and buy this if you've got the cash to spend on it. Uh, my last issue that I'm going to have to um, pick up um, of Batman The Dark Knight issue 15, and this concludes the Scarecrow storyline. Um, they kind of wrapped it up very quickly. Um, <clears throat> we last saw uh, Scarecrow had let off this kind of super fear toxin within Gotham and the crowd are just going crazy with fear. There's looting, there's, you know, they're all ripping pieces off each other. And this is a kind of f uh, a, a race to find the antidote. And, uh, well, quite literally, Batman bleeds for his city to to um to to save them it, it it's a bit icky to be honest um but like i said it it all kind of wraps up incredibly quickly there's a kind of tag bit on towards the end with his current girlfriend this pianist natalia um who we're not quite sure about she i think she's got um, motives that are not good for Bruce but um, the problem again with this book is and a lot of people will probably find this too that are into the whole death of the family because this hasn't seen any um, any likelihood that this is going to be involved in it at all is when is this happening 
Um, what is the timeline between this and Death of the Family? Um, again, there's a kind of... It almost feels like you're reading Batman and Robin, which again, that's another title I'm dropping, because you kind of have this whole father and son um, relation... obviously the relationship, but the dynamics that, you know, Robin wants to prove to his father that he is there for him, and when he asks him to do something, however life-threatening to Batman this could be, he will stick by his word and do these things for his father. Um, I'm kind of glad in a way that I'm dropping this now. Um, the new writer on it, um, Greg Horowitz, he's actually doing a much better job um, than, than previous writers on this, uh, but just not enough for me to um, go the extra mile and keep picking it up. On to better things, <clears throat> Justice League Dark issue 15 and we finally find out where um, Zatanna and Timothy Hunter were spirited away to, transported and it's this, I guess it's an alternate dimension and I think it's called Epoch. I'm not sure if this is the kind of the place where they've gone's name or this could be somebody in the background we don't know about. But um, they have landed on what appears to be an alternative planet, universe, time. And it's it, it seems to be doing strange things to our team. Um, Zaytana pumped up with magic. Her, her kind of backward spell magic is super strong. And she certainly needs it to, um, to fight off this kind of protector, policeman kind of guardian of this of this land where it appears magic is outlawed and anyone who uses it um, depending on the level of use of magic can go from like incarceration to um, execution. Um, this storyline definitely seems to be heading towards the the science versus magic kind of pathway um, because it, it's it's used so often, in especially in this issue. Um, while the rest of the gang are are, try, are still in in Nanda Parbat looking uh, for a way back, uh, a way not a way back, a way to find Zatanna and go and rescue her with Timothy. Um, they eventually find it's Timothy's blood that kind of opened up this portal that transported them away. And so John Constantine, being the little git he is as usual, um, goes and gets um, Timothy's dad. Hopefully his kind of DNA blood type will be the same and open the portal, which indeed it does. Otherwise we won't get this wonderful kind of climax um, to the end of, of this title where as soon as the team end up in this kind of let's not use magic land um, strange very strange things start happening to the rest of the team John Constantine it's hilarious he he can't help but to tell the truth uh, there's no conning here there's no lying everything that comes out of his mouth is is actually the truth um, his his idea that he's actually very scared of what's going on, um, that he wants all the rest of the team to like him, um, and he just basically can't stop himself. Um, uh, Madame Xanadu suddenly starts getting older and older and older. Um, Black Orchid suddenly transforms into this kind of primal beast thing, which may have connections to um, what we were told a few issues back, where she's kind of part green and part red maybe that's going to be linked in here and and dead man well he's alive again at least for a little while a great great issue from Jeff Lemire uh, hitting all the right notes with the characters and just making a really exciting story that moves along very well very quickly and doesn't let up great series Probably, if you get the last issue, a good place to start and jump on with. Um, double hitter from iVampire because I didn't get to pick it up last week. He um, 
he, my comic book guy didn't have it so I'll just quickly skim over issue 14 although brilliant issue but sadly Andrea Sorrentino's last issue on art um, this was the confrontation between um, our good guys for now anyway which was Mary um, is it Robert John John Troughton and um, Deborah Dancer. Um, last we saw, they were being confronted by um, Alan Bennett, ready to rip out their throats. And it's kind of their escape and the the idea that they're going to have to go back to where Andrew Bennett was originally sired to kind of, and I'm not sure about this whole thing, but to, to kind of recreate the scenario um, in the hope that this will turn Andrew Bennett back. Um, we get a little bit more of um, Andrew's plans for the future and his whole ruling the world and turning um, people who are a lot more than kind of soldier cannon fodder than, than the last armies that he's, he's joined, he's fought with, he's fought against. Uh, just another fantastic issue of I Vampire um, with just tons of twists and beautiful artwork by Andrew, Sorrent Andrew Sorrentino. And so we move on. The latest issue, issue 15, and Andrew Bennett is uh, taking his, his two compadres, um, Tig and this new kind of magician guy, um, to the Val Valhelsing um, fortress where he's after something. He needs something. So it's blood, guts, chaos, slashing, um, biting of throats plenty. Yes, huge chaos, big fight scenes, um, which is just fun. That kind of interaction between the three um, it is just perfect. Um, and over the other side of the pond we've got the the kind of the good guys mary deborah and um john um, in england um raising spirits of times gone by and we get to see the coachman from the if you remember if you've read the annual um uh, where we got the kind of the origin story of Andrew Bennett, how he became a vampire, but also one of those good vampires. Um, the demon's lock that kept in the, the, the first vampire. Um, while the coachman isn't very much help, um, he does um, reveal something to Mary um, which affects her terribly and that is the letter that Andrew Bennett wrote um, to her. Um, read it, she's torn, torn apart for the love of her life. <clears throat> um, and I don't know why this didn't actually come as much as a surprise. Um, maybe it's because it has already been revealed but the Andrew Bennett's sire is revealed in this issue, but I thought we already knew it, so it didn't kind of feel very surprising. <laughs> That's all I can say on that. Um, maybe I'm wrong here, um, or maybe I just thought it was obvious. Um, someone might be able to remind me on that one. Um, so yes, the, the culmination of our good guys the reveal of um, Andrew Bennett's sire, and um, Andrew Bennett gets to his prize, which is the Van Helsing Armoury. And this is no ordinary armoury. These are like the worst tools to destroy a vampire with. What does Andrew Bennett want with that? Time will tell. Um, Fayelkov's writing has just been a pure joy to read. We do get the new store, uh, the new artist on here, um, Dennis Calero. At first, you're reading it and you think, oh, Sorrentino's not gone because it is a very similar artwork, um, only in really the sense that the colorist is still the same. So you still have those kind of the washed out colors. Uh, the, the, the washed out tone colours um, that has been used previously but as you read on uh, and you look on you see that Calero's um, artwork is, is kind of 
a lot cleaner. Um, the ladies look a lot more classically beautiful uh, and good looking. So the element, the, the, the style is still there though the kind of freneticness of Sorrentino's artwork may not be to the fore. But still, I Vampire, a must, must for anyone who likes their kind of dark energy titles. So finally, pick of the week, which of course you'll have worked out because what you saw right at the beginning of the video. And it is of course Fatal Issue 11 perfect and I don't often say this if you are a fan of those um, those early kind of eerie and uh, creepy horror comics uh, you will probably love this um, it certainly has that feel it's a one-shot story uh, Brew Baker's already said um, the main storyline is going on hiatus for a while and what we're gonna get are one-shot storylines that may not necessarily um, have our main characters in them but will certainly um, develop and enrich our Fatal Universe um, so we have this one-shot story, the case of Alfred Ravenscroft. Um, um, Ravenscroft is a, a writer. He um, had some kind of pulp-type comics um, in the past, and now he lives on his own in a remote house with his mother. It's all very kind of psycho-esque in a way, um, and we get more kind of information and history on Josephine we begin by going back to the 1930s in Texas and again we see um, the the devastation on men's lives that Josephine um, wrought on on everybody she she uses and then in essence spits out uh, we also see Josephine's kind of lack of control at the beginning of these these powers she has over men, this um, uh, fatal attraction um, and how she really at the beginning couldn't control them and had men f literally fighting for her. Um, we, from meeting Ravenscroft, we go even further back to the 1800s, the late 1800s and we see him as a child and his kind of involvement with our cult and, and the McVicar character who leads the cult, um, it's all very kind of dark and spooky and scary and intimidating. It's just one hell of a book and it's all done in one issue. Um, I hate to say this, but it probably is the best issue of Fatal that has come out yet. And it's not even really part of the main storylines. Um, as good as Fatal and as high a quality as I've always felt it's been, this really did outdo itself. Um, obviously, Sean Phillips' artwork on here, beautiful as always. Um, whatever era he's drawing uh, truly evokes the spirit of the time. Just an absolute pickup, uh, a must. The second volume just came out this week. Um, they've done another print run of the first one. Please just go out and pick up this great series and then jump on board with these single issues. And that is me out. Um, what else is there to say? Um, a few people have been asking me about the new titles I'm going to be picking up. Uh, and I was going to do a video um, where somewhere I was going to say what these new titles I was replacing, the ones I was dropping. Um, but I'm not going to. You're going to find out as I um, obviously get them. What I will say is um, the three new ones I'm picking up, they are all independent titles. None of them come from Marvel or DC. They all come out this month at some point or other. So there your clues. <laughs> That's what you have. And an extra clue. 
um, if he's watching, um, Sean, Beardo, Minutia Minute. It's a book that he's probably going to be picking up too. And it's a series that I've always wanted to get into, but never felt now, until now, that there has been a way in. And I think this is going to be the series that's going to do it. Cryptic. Anyway, thank you very much all for watching. This has been my first review of the year. If it's your first time here, hit a subscribe button, which could be anywhere at the moment. Um, give it a big thumbs up and comment down in the box below. Did you get any of my titles? Did you pick up Fatal? Wasn't it good? Um, what else did you pick up? What did I miss out on this week? Until next week, take care. Have a good one. I'll be watching.